Okay, so I, I think, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of the speakers have sort of tried to poke around as, you know, what questions were the organizers actually asking? And so I'll give you my interpretation of that. Um, we've heard a lot of beautiful talks about latent variable models where you can extract the, the relevant variables for a task, let's say. Um, you may think that they have an interesting dynamics, but it's often extremely difficult to write down that dynamics. So instead, people construct various forms of network models. We've been hearing about this for the last two days um, in order to capture that dynamics. And you know, this is the program, right? And, and it, it has produced beautiful results. You've heard many of them all over the course of this meeting. I have no criticism of it, but I have a, a, a pang. And the pang has to do with what the experimentalists are doing meantime which is acquiring enormous amounts of data about cell types, about connectomics. This is just going to grow and grow. We're going to get thousands of those cell types, huge connectomics, maybe the whole mouse brain. Um, and the question is, you know, I, th I, I interpreted what you guys were kind of poking at, is how do we bridge this, this divide? Um, how can we make contact with that kind of neuroscience in the kind of neuroscience you've been hearing about? where we you know, dimensionally reduce, as Sarah was saying, and, and work in quite a different universe. Um, this is an enormously difficult question, which I do not have an answer to. Um, I'm not even sure in many systems it's possible, but there's a N equals one existence proof, and I just want to talk about it because it's so beautiful. So there is an example and a bunch of very talented researchers who basically dance back and forth over this bridge all the time. Um, and it's just inspiring, I think, to all of us just to see it. Uh, and so I, I'm kind of giving a report about what happens if all your dreams come true. Maybe not all your dreams. I hope you have more dreams than crossing that bridge. But maybe, you know, there's good stuff on the other side. So, uh, okay. Now, the model we're going to be talking about is sort of the granddaddy of latent variable abstract network models. Namely, uh, the latent variable model of, of a two-dimensional vector of two variables. Um, and in very nice formalism, in a bunch of papers that I'm citing here, um, you can derive from just the, the fact that you're interested in that kind of uh, latent variable space, you can derive a family of models, this is not the unique one, but this is sort of the granddaddy of them, uh, of this form. It involves assigning an angle to each neuron. Um, and of course, this model, I, I assume lots of you know about it, uh, has been applied to all sorts of brain regions from primary visual cortex to head direction cells um, and to the system that um, I'm teasing you with that's coming up. So that's the first step in the process here. And it's kind of neat that the first step is a particularly well worked out uh, step. In these papers, the relationship between the, the latent variables and the network model is particularly clear. So we're on very good, good uh, thing. But we want to go further. We want to cross the bridge uh, on my first slide. And that involves um, you know, going from these activities in networks, which are pretty abstract variables. We make contact with linear uh, combinations of real neurons' activities. But you know, it's a stretch to call all of these real neurons in many of these models. So how do you get from those R values to real cell types and all that? And you know, this model makes a very definite uh, assumption about the connectivity between neurons, between neuron I and J. Um, how do you get from there to the connectome? All right, so I, I probably most of you know what's, what I'm, I have up my sleeve here. Oh, I wanted to just mention one more thing for please remember. Um, the input here you, you might think is less interesting, but it's going to be important at the end of my talk. So often a, a canonical input to these kind of ring attractor models or bump models uh, is a certain strength I um, and then a cosine of the, the neuron that you're connecting to minus some angle that's associated uh, with that input. So just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so of course the, 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 the system that I'm going to present to you uh, is this fly central complex where um, almost like a miracle, all, all, of, all of this falls into place in a very beautiful way. Um, and I'm really, as I say, I'm reporting here uh, about of other people's work. Uh, Vivek and Gabby, of course, have pioneered this field. But I also want to talk about uh, theoretical work by Barbara Webb that, that uh, I think it'll add to the discussion. So I just want to give them credits uh, for um, what I'm about to say. I'm, I'm reporting. Um, 
Now, there have been talks at this meeting about this system. Gabby gave one yesterday, um, and Hermstadt also gave uh, one yesterday. And at the main meeting, um, uh, Marcella Norman from um, Anne's lab uh, gave another talk. So hopefully you've been exposed to it somewhat. I'm, you know, again, they all did a beautiful job. What I want to really do is think about it in the context of these generic, um, more abstract models that we apply to systems and we've seen applied to systems all over the place. Um, I just want to give it with a little different twist, maybe. Um, so uh, I want to just mention some other collaborators, the people who have sort of taught me this system along with the people on that page. Um, Sung Su Kim was postdoc in Vivek's lab and has gone on to his own uh, lab, Sandra Romani at um, Janelia, and then Peter and Cheng are in uh, Gabby's, Gabby's group. All right, I'm not really going to talk about their, their work. As I say, I'm going to give a sort of a funny report with this sort of twist on making the link from the left side of my front of my first slide to the, to the right side. OK. So um, just to give you the, the, the players here, uh, this is the ellipsoid body in a beautiful picture. Uh, that's, of course, where this ring attractor lives. It's actually a ring. Um, and it also lives. Uh, in this other area called the protocerebral pro bridge. So, you know, just to give you the, the players in this game. Okay. Now, I think you, you probably all know the, the great discovery of, of Selig and Jayaraman that um, like the bump model or the ring attractor model that I showed you at the beginning, there's a self-sustained uh, bolus of activity that exists in this ring, uh, the, the ellipsoid body that I, that I showed you on the previous uh, slide. Um, and that that tracks uh, visual objects in the world, and in the dark, uh, it, it tracks turns of the animals through a sort of a self-perception uh, of turning, and, and tracks a fixed uh, location or fixed direction in the world. So this is a compass, not a magnetic compass, but a visually driven and sort of internally driven compass that can maintain uh, a, a direction. Um, this is a, a, a result from Gabby's lab. I just wanted to show it to you because it shows both parts of the system. So this is the ring attractor model, but the same neurons that exist in the, in the ellipsoid body project up to the protocerebral bridge. So you have this double, uh, triple, if you want, representation. All right. So the beautiful thing here, as they say, you know, it, it, in assembling this, it's sort of like if you said, well, you know, what if... What if there was really a benevolent being, you know, that gave you all these gifts? And, and here's an example. You know, the first thing, if you want to apply a bump model, is you say, well, what are these angles? You know, how do I assign angles to neurons? In this system, the whole system is segmented into angles, going around the circle. These segments that I've shown here are 45 degrees, um, and you can just look at them and tell which angle you're talking about. So the system, uh, it, revealed these angles in a, in a beautifully clear way, right in the anatomy, uh, not just in the, in the, in the physiology. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we can assign these angles, um, and let me do this in a, in a more sort of abstract way. So uh, just let me just see if this, uh, yeah. Um, so these are the, the so-called compass neurons, EPG neurons, um, and they're each assigned uh, an angle, so these guys go obviously to the top of the ring and then uh, make projections as well in, in the bridge. And as you go around the ring, you just go to the left, let's say in, in the upper thing, and you go around the ring. So you can just assign these to the different things. I want to mention something about this structure uh, that's kind of unique. Uh, usually structures like this in, in the brain are reflection symmetric, or in the body, right? Our whole bodies are reflection symmetric about the middle. And you can see this has been numbered with sort of an assumption that it's reflection symmetric, but it's not actually. Uh, it's, it's the same on both sides. And I, I don't know, I, somebody who knows anatomy, I'm just curious how often that happens. I think it's quite an unusual uh, feature of this system. I don't know what it means, but it's a, it's a feature. Okay, so in the, in the model, so now, you know, it's sort of let's, let's take this bump model and start taking it seriously. Um, so one of the things that is, is characteristic of this sort of canonical model is this cosine connection pattern. So the strength of the connection between a neuron with angle I and another neuron with angle G, J goes like the cosine of the difference, okay? 
So um, now it doesn't really matter to a bump model whether you have an exact cosine here. You need something with nearby attraction and, and far away inhibition. But it matters sometimes whether you have a cosine. And we'll get to that later. So it's just kind of first thing you might be interested in is, can neurons make cosine connectivity patterns? Can they make strength that go like a cosine? And in this system, there's a beautiful example of that. It's called a delta-7 neuron. Um, it connects EPGs to EPGs, among other things. Um, and, uh, and they go through this, this thing. Um, and uh, it's, it's an inhibitory neuron as far as on, on the EPGs, at least. And so if you imagine that it was contributing to this cosine, um, you know, you, you have a sign flip to do. Let me just stress that this is not the only pathway. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm plucking, uh, you know, I'm selecting a particularly nice example, but it's part of this pathway. At any rate, um, if it contributes to this pathway, it has to do it uh, with a couple of sign flips. Since it's inhibitory, there's a sign flip here, and if you want to recover from that sign flip and get the cosine back, you have to shift by pi uh, in order to, to get the thing to come out right. And if you look at these neurons, again, the anatomy is, is, a, is a gift from, from the, the universe here. Um, you see exactly that pattern in, in the anatomy where uh, the input to this uh, neur neuron from the EPGs, so EPGs go to here, these compass neurons, uh, the input is spread out as if it was a cosine. Um, and then the output is shifted and of course, you can go through the compartments here and count, and it's shifted by 180 degrees. So, so you know, on the light level, it works well. But again, in the, in the fly now, you can just keep right on going. Um, and keeping on going here uh, means looking up at, in the connectome of the fly. There are actually two connectomes available. One of them has already been uh, analyzed by Vivek and his group uh, for its implications for, for this system. Um, and the other one just became available, so every one of you can look at it if you want. Um, and so you can go in there and say, if I look at this pattern of connectivity, do I see a cosine? Okay, so here's what happens. So I just wanted to point out that um, there's a lot of people who did this. Uh, this, is the this is the paper announcing that, um, that data, so it has a lot of people. But I, I would really, you know, go to the website, it's fun. You can poke around in the fly brain. All right, so, there are a number of these delta-7 neurons, and here are the connections from them to the EPGs. These are the ones that I pointed out were 180 degree flipped. Um, and, and they tile uh, the different angles, so the different EPGs here correspond to different angles, so they tile like that. And then you can look on the other side uh, at the, uh, the input. So this is the EPGs going to the delta-7s, and it certainly starts looking cosine-y. And then if you just align these, so you, you, they're shifted relative to each other, but if you just align them up and look at the numbers of synapses that you get, just pulled out of the data set, you get a beautiful cosine curve. Of course, shift it upward because you can't have negative numbers. Um, and, and in these fly systems, you know, typical connections will be multiple synapses, and, and a good proxy for the strength is probably the number of synapses. So the fact that the number of synapses in this pathway describes a, a cosine probably is a good indication that it really is a cosine. So again, I just wanted to you know, share the joy of being able to start with Heim you know, made up a cosine because he felt like at one point, and, and, and there it is. You know? is Heim, Heim isn't here, Heim should dance. Okay, now um, this is a stationary bump, but of course uh, you can think of these line attractors or ring attractors and, as integrators, and so what if you want to move the bump? And you know, this is well known, that all you gotta do is add a sinusoid into the connectivity uh, in, in order to get the bump to move. And uh, so how do you do this? Well, one thing you can do is just have another cosine type connectivity that's shifted a little bit. Um, and then if you just do the, the usual cosine you know, addition law, uh, this will induce a sinusoidal term. So the, the signal that you're picking up this a velocity integration term would be a, a shifted cosine, for example. And it doesn't matter what it's shifted by, that just changes the numbers here. Um, and the idea is that now this, uh, this ring attractor will become an integrator and the velocity will be you know, proportional to that alpha and will move in response to it. Um, and again, you know, the work from, from both uh, Vivek's lab and, and Gabby's lab identified a, another pathway that has exactly this property. So there's another pathway from EPGs to EPGs, um, and 
Uh, here's the EVG picture, but it's shifted. It's shifted over by one compartment so that um, it, it's, it's got a delta in it, and that delta happens to be 45 degrees. So you, you see exactly the kinds of things you need uh, to move the bump, and indeed, these papers show that this moves bumps and, and integrates self-motion signals. So this is the system by which in the dark, if the fly turns, it can, it can change its compass direction to still point, let's say, to that wall or whatever. Um, so I have a little model of it. Actually, uh, again, the VEX group and others have, have built the model. Uh, I build this model, it's fun. It's an easy model to build. Um, and this is uh, gonna run, and what you'll see it's, it's just going to be a stationary bump for a while, but then I'm going to uh, simulate a right turn, which means that this guy, you see how it got broader and, and higher, and now the bump moves to the left to compensate for the right turn, and now, now it's turned into a left turn. So this is a you know, very beautiful model based on the old stuff that we did years and years ago, only, only it's real. That's, that's, that's what's cool. <laughs> uh, all right, so this is a, a very favorite um, diagram of mine uh, from Gabby's lab. Um, and basically what, what Gabby talked about, if he, but if you didn't see it, um, is he has ways of inducing flies to walk in straight directions, walk in a straight line for a long time, like an hour. Um, and this is a fly doing that, but it's in the dark. So it doesn't, so it's, it's actually walking around in circles. That's what you're seeing here. So this is the fly's heading direction, and, and it's, it's not succeeding, in, it thinks it's going in a straight line, but it's not succeeding. It's going around in circles. Now, that shouldn't surprise you at all if you know anything about bump bottles because bumps drift, right? They, it, it's not a perfect uh, line attractor or ring attractor uh, in nature probably. And so the bump drifts a little bit in the dark. There's no visual signal to bring it back. Um, and so there, it's drifting away. Now, what the fly does though is to turn when it drifts. So it, actually, if you look at the bump in the brain of the fly, it's rock solid because every time it drifts, the fly turns to bring it back. Um, and that tells you something really interesting. First of all, it tells you the fly really thinks it's going in a straight line, which is kind of cool. But the other thing is, is that there's a goal direction in, in the fly's brain that is more stable than the bump, right? The bump is drifting here, and it's drifting like this. But the heading that the fly wants to go on is, is rock solid. And that's an important lesson here which is that in this system, you know, we tend to, when we build these models, we, we have a line attractor, a ring attractor, we say we're gonna use it for everything, we're gonna integrate, we're gonna remember. This system does two things. It uses this system to remember locations, you know, directions in the dark, to integrate self-motion, but it has another system which uses some sort of synaptic plasticity or intrinsic excitability change to, to hold things around longer. So another really beautiful thing about this system is you see both of these kind of mechanisms of memory that we study in our models uh, side by side. And um, it, just to, to tell you about the plasticity, there's, there's a lot of plasticity in this system. Um, and this is work uh, from both from Vivek's lab and also from Rachel Wilson's lab about how the visual input gets into the fly, which I'll just go over quickly. Um, but there, there are basically visual inputs with standard kind of receptive fields localized in part of the, of the retinotopic space, uh, and they come into the system, but when they come in, they do a weird thing, which is they just go all the way around the circle. It's like you, you took the retinotopy and completely threw it away. And th what these papers explain, I won't do it, is that the, the specificity of the system comes back through plasticity. The system learns the visual objects in the environment, um, and it maps them onto the, the, the bump, the compass, so that you get a, a, a fixed relationship between the visual world and the compass. And this system is, is incredibly plastic. You can do all sorts of crazy things with it. Okay, so what can you do with a ring attractor? This now launches into sort of a more theoretical part of the talk. Um, so, you know, one thing we can know is we can remember. You can put the bump there, and hopefully if it doesn't drift too much, it'll stay there. And, you know, that, that I think, has been shown by, by these laboratories that, you know, that does maintain some sense of direction in the dark when the visual objects are no longer pinning down that thing. The other thing is you can integrate, typical line attractor, ring attractor. And again, there's very nice um, 
evidence that you know the, the self motion signals are integrated through the system I just described to you uh, so that for example in the dark I, if I turn I know you know the walls still over there um, but I, I want to propose uh, again you know with, with sort of Barbara Webb in, in the back of my mind uh, another uh, purpose for these ring attractors and that is to find maxima and the point is this, that if you put a, an input into a ring attractor like this and uh, nothing else, it will just move to the, to the peak of the bump. It'll find that peak. And it'll do that kind of independently of the magnitude. So you'll get a bump at that peak, even if it's a wimpy signal or, or not. So, you know, it sort of finds, finds the maximum. Now, what's this good for? What I want to propose is it's good for adding vectors. Um, okay, so now I, I can't resist a kind of a joke slide, but it's actually the most important slide. So, but it's still a joke slide because I couldn't resist. Um, because, because I taught, you know, students when I was in a younger faculty, I taught them to add vectors for years, you know. And, and you know, there's this classic problem in your physics one classes, you know, you have two vectors, you want to add them together, you want to determine the angle that that sum makes. And, uh, you know, you add the x's and you add the y's and you take an arc tangent, you know, you probably all learned this. Um, so, you know, I was thinking of, of all of you, you you're, some of you are young faculty, a lot of you will be young faculty, I have confidence in that. Um, and, and you're going to, you know, uh, meet a, a different kind of student than, than I taught in my youth. Um, today's student only wants to do one thing. They want to optimize. <laughs> okay? So you're in trouble, you know, they're not gonna do this. So. But the good news is that we can recast this problem as an optimization problem. So you see. <laughs> and, and the answer is that if you form this function of angle, okay, and it should you should notice that it looks very much like the inputs that I was trying to tell you to remember. If you make that function of angle and you maximize it, you will get this formula. It's a homework assignment. Um, and, and you know, if you don't want to take the derivative and set it to zero, feel free you know, to build that. The D <laughs> now, now, the students I taught you know, were following in the tradition of uh, you know, basically the dead white men. Whoops, I gave away my punchline. Uh, dead white men. But these new students are going to be following in the tradition of insects. Uh, and that's what I would like to argue, that, that insects do this calculation this way, by using uh, these, these attractors to find maxima and by arranging inputs like that. And, and the kind of neatest example of that, uh, well, let me, let me just say this first and then give you an example. So the idea is that this input, if you wanted to add two vectors, could just be this exact function that I wrote down. Um, and uh, and, the, and the bump will then go to the, the vector sum. So you've added the vectors. Um, in, in reality, you know, it, it's, I'm replacing that term with this complicated term, and I've written it continuous, but of course you want to make the discrete approximation. So the angle here that you're optimizing over is the angle of the, of the wedges, tiles in, the, in, the, in this system. Okay, so let me wind up uh, by doing uh, Barbara Webb's version of this. Um, and, and, you know, she was thinking about bees uh, and, and really had a, a very ambitious way of thinking about this. But you'll see that it, it uses this basic idea. The idea is that, you know, you travel along some path. Of course, any animal needs to do this. Um, so, yeah, this is the, the, it isn't just Barbara Webb. It's uh, this, this paper that presents this model, uh, she and her collaborators. So, you know, you, you move along a path. And the idea is at any point you want to know how to get home. That, that's the homing problem. Um, and so you can think of, of what you need to do is to integrate all these little vectors, your displacements over time, so that when you get over here, you'll be able to integrate and figure out, okay, home is that way, and maybe run straight home if you're threatened or something. Uh, so, so that's the idea. Uh, now we know how to do this the, the modern way, right? We're not gonna add vectors. What we're gonna do is represent heading direction just like the compass system does, okay, in a set of uh, of, of discrete set that represents this function. So that's the heading direction. So that's, that's representing all these things. Um, now, in this case, we need to modulate it by the speed. So how fast are you going when you do this, which is not part of the, of the ellipsoid body bump that I talked about, but we'll imagine that it happens. Uh, you modify it by speed. 
And then, remember, to add vectors, all you gotta do is add these things together. So now all you gotta do to do the homing thing is just to integrate that over time. So the, the cool thing here is that it turns a vector problem into a scalar problem. You just have to do one scalar integral. Then when you're done, when you wanna know how to get home, you optimize it and you go home, okay? And that, here's an example of that working. So you, you take this function, you find the argmax, um, and you have to flip it by 180 degrees. It's actually, because you know, we wanna go home, but you, know, you get these, these vectors home. Um, so, so this is speculative. I don't think anybody knows if this is done in the fly. I, I don't think we know exactly how this is done, but, but um, just wait. I guess the answer is just wait, <laughs> and, and, and it will all be revealed. Um, I, I should mention here that, you know, I mentioned that this is not the, the, the ring I was talking about, that I sort of think of this a, as the central complex, which is what's drawn here, as having a representational body, which is this ellipsoid body that represents your, you know, directions in the world, and then a computational body, which is this thing called the fan shape body, which is another uh, ring attractor potential structure um, that, uh, that's much more complicated and needs to be worked out. Okay, so let me come back to the bridge. And, and um, you know, the question is, can we do this again? Um, so why did this work so well? The reason it worked so well is the anatomy is spectacular, all right? The anatomy um, really uh, looks, th this paper that, that I've, I've been referring to in the anatomy, um, you should look at it, you know, it's sort of neuro porn. It's just so beautiful. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, I think if you look at it, you'll say, I, I have a good hunch of how this works. Now, of course, you know, uh, this experiment also had to do a lot of work to show that's true, but the anatomy was spectacular. The other thing is there's a really beautiful tie-in between the cell types and the function. You know, every time, and, and you know, the, the experts could have done this more, every time I wanted to talk about something, I could name the cell type that did it. So. That, that was lucky. And the other thing is that, you know, um, the behavior, that, that you can get a very pure behavior, basically flies by into virtual reality. That, that, that um, means that you can do these with flies, you know, say walking in a straight line for an hour, that's a pretty dedicated uh, organism. So are we ever gonna be able to do it again? Uh, will it work in other systems? Of course, you all know the problems, and, and you know, the problems are that the, the, the computations tend to be much more spread out. I'm thinking of mammalian cortex, you know. They tend to be much more spread out, so you can't point to that nice little donut in the middle of the brain so easily. Um, there are many, many cell types, and they probably don't map onto function so beautifully. Um, the behaviors are, are probably less controlled. I don't know, I'm just making up stuff here. But um, so, so it's really hard. Um, when you get done with teaching your students how to add vectors by this insane method, <laughs> fix this, okay? That's for you. And, and all I can say is that there's, we have an example, and so maybe we can do this again and keep doing it and, and, and unite these two sides of neuroscience. All right, I'll stop there. Yeah, I wonder. Sure that so, do you fine. guys buy it? Do you buy it? I think you got the question. So, I was arguing that the fan shaped body and the ellipsoid body are really separating representation from computation. Um, I, I, that's my view. I, I, do, you, do you buy it? Maybe. Maybe. He says maybe. But I, I, I kind of nodded. I think it is cool, right? I, I, and, and it might be that when you have a nice representation, you know, you don't want to mess with it. Um, and, and, the, and when you start doing computations, so you, so you separate them. I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting feature. Uh, this is a so you kind of presented all this as like the one example where this, where this works, where at least from the context of this, of this uh, two-day session, this means like finding latent dynamics in neural data. And that, but actually this is an example where that's not at all what happened. Theory that came way before neural data, mm -hmm. and then also all, all this anatomy and stuff that started to come afterwards. But mm -hmm. it really started with theory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, was I saying it didn't? 
No, I'm just saying, I'm just wondering in terms of, so I mean, we see the kind of underlying, or do you see a broader this that is being done that, that the process of finding latent so, so I would say, you know, on my first slide, on the left side, you know, latent variable stuff, we collectively are very good at that, I think. We're, we're, we're getting better. I think it's a credit to the theory community that this model already existed, right, in, in multiple forms. Um, that's what we're here for. We're supposed to do that, right? It's the tying down. I mean, I think what people find frustrating there is at some point, you know, you make your connection with the dimensional reduced variables and all that, and, and it stops. Um, and, and it's very difficult to go farther. So the, that's what I was talking about. That there's, there's at least an example now where you can go a whole lot farther. Uh, we can actually save more questions during the discussion panel. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, let, let's uh, move on to the discussion panel and welcome the, the speaker for today's session. Oh, let's give another mm -hmm. applause to the <laughs> We're going to plug 